afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final Max Weber lecture of this academic year. We are more than pleased to have with us uh, Professor Jens Heinmüller from Stanford, who will also be receiving the honorary doctorate of the EUI in political social sciences on Friday. And without further ado, I'll uh, pass on the word to Ipek Ginelli, who is a Max Weber fellow with us, who will be introducing our today's speaker in more detail. Please. Thanks, Juho, and good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are pleased to welcome Professor Jens Heimler for the final Max, Max Weber lecture of the year and as a keynote speaker for the 17th Max Weber Fellows Conference. Jens Heimler is the Kimberly Glenn Professor in Political Science and the Director of Graduate Studies of the Department of Political Science at Stanford University. He is the faculty co director of the Stanford Immigration Policy Lab that is focused on the design and evaluation of immigration and integration policies and programs. His research interests include immigration, statistical methods, political economy, and political behavior. He has published over 65 articles, many of them in top general science journals and top field journals in political science, statistics, economics, and business. These journals include Science, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Political Analysis, American Political Science Review, and American Journal of Political Science. He published three open source software packages, and his research has received awards and fundings from many prestigious institutions, including the Carnegie Corporation, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Robin Hood Foundation, the National Science Foundation, the Swiss SNF, and many more. Heim Müller received his PhD from Harvard University and also studied at the London School of Economics, Brown University, and the University of Tübingen. Before joining Stanford, he served on the faculty of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Today's lecture, titled How Can Democracies Facilitate the Integration of Newcomers? Building an Evidence and Innovation Agenda for Applied Migration Research, will describe professors' work on migration at the Immigration Policy Lab to find answers regarding one of the most defining challenges of the 21st century. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jens Heinmüller. Thank you very much, Ipek and Yuhu, for the uh, introduction and the invitation. I'm really excited to be here um, to talk to you about some of the research that I'm doing at the Immigration Policy Lab. It's really great to see so many young scholars presenting their work at this conference here today, and I'm very much looking forward to learning from your comments uh, and feedback. Uh, and so just in terms of housekeeping, given that this is an interdisciplinary audience, I was advised to give more of an overview of some of the work and keep it a bit more non-technical and more accessible. Uh, but trying is not succeeding, so if there's anything that's kind of like unclear or doesn't make sense to you or something, feel free to just ask a question, and I'm happy to address it um, uh, right away or at the end uh, during uh, Q&A. Um, so with no further ado, let's just uh, jump right in. So a lot of the work that I do um, at the Immigration Policy Lab is motivated by this, what's often called the big sort of immigrant integration challenge, and it's this based on this observation that many host countries in Europe or North America or uh, the Global South as well have really experienced a dramatic increase in the size and the diversity of the immigrant and refugee uh, populations. Um, and this has brought with it sort of uh, this massive policy challenge that governments are facing in these countries, which is what do you do to actually successfully integrate all of these newcomers into the host country economy, into the host country society, and into the host country uh, polity? And there's now a fair amount of evidence that a lot of governments are actually not doing a particularly good job at this task, right? We have quite a bit of evidence suggesting that immigrants often face systematic disadvantages um, in local labor markets, and that countries fail to really unlock the economic potential that migration, in principle, can bring to a country. Uh, immigrants are also often excluded from political participation, and this then begs the question of whether this might be democratically deficient, right, if there's a large segment of the population that is excluded from the democratic process. And so this begs this overarching question which motivates a lot of my work, which is what policies and interventions can governments actually use to effectively facilitate the successful integration of newcomers? And unfortunately, for governments that want to facilitate this policy goal, there isn't in many domains actually 
a lot of rigorous evidence to go by. Instead, what we typically have when we talk immigration or we hear about it in the news, right, we have these ideological knuckle fights where there's like partisan bashing on both sides of people who like immigration, want more of it, and people who oppose immigration. And we get basically these, uh, these, these partisan arguments that are full of ideology, but we don't really have a lot of rigorous evidence, and there's also not a lot of innovation uh, in this space. Um, and the stakes here, I think, are quite high, right? For governments who can get these choices right, they can really uh, <clears throat> unlock some of the benefits that immigration can bring. But if you get these choices wrong, right, you can set the seed for integration failures that can really perpetuate inequalities that might persist um, over generations. So the approach that we take at the Immigration Policy Lab is, is that we basically embark on what we call this research and innovation agenda. So the goal is to really build an evidence base and to foster innovation. So our goal is to try to figure out kind of like what works, what doesn't, for whom and why. And the approach that we take to do that is very much based on research and learning partnerships that we engage with. So a lot of the work that we do is we partner with governments and immigrant service providers and NGOs in various countries and we embark with them together on this journey of trying to figure out, okay, what are actually the impacts of the programs that you're currently running? And for that, we then basically get access to the data. We run experimental and quasi-experimental studies to quantify the impacts of these programs and estimate their returns. The second thing we do is that often policymakers are not necessarily so interested in terms of like finding the impacts of the policies that they already have on the books, but they ask us, well, you know, can you come up with something better? Like, can you sort of like, um, actually bring innovation, leveraging the scientific expertise. And for that second bucket of work, what we do is we engage in this process of co-design, where we basically work together with the governments, look at the existing evidence, and try to come up with new programs and policies, and then are looking to rigorously test them to see whether they actually improve outcomes. And then ultimately, the goal is to aggregate these results across contexts, both the positive findings, but also, very importantly, the negative findings, um, to the policy community so that other governments uh, and organizations can learn across contexts. And so on this slide, you see a bit of an overview of like the four main buckets of work that we have. Uh, we have quite a lot of work that looks at refugees. So here we're looking at things like uh, placement policies or asylum decisions and wait times, uh, language skills and training, uh, things like private co-sponsorship, um, refugee return programs, things like that. We have a second bucket of research that looks at permanent residents. So here we are interested in things like uh, civic integration contracts that a lot of uh, countries are using now, uh, sort of barriers and impacts of naturalization, the recognition of foreign credentials, uh, etc. And then we have a third bucket that looks at undocumented immigrants, uh, where we're interested in things like legalization programs, access to healthcare and education, um, enforcement policies, things like this. And then the fourth bucket of work looks at the native-born population, where we're interested in things like attitudes towards immigration, discrimination, and also efforts to basically try to reduce prejudice towards migrants and the returns that these efforts might or might not yield. And we do this mostly in North America and in Europe, but we also have projects in the Middle East uh, and in Africa. And so obviously in this keynote, I'm not gonna be able to talk about all of these here. And so what I thought I'm gonna do is I'm basically gonna dive more deeply into two multi-year sort of research streams and show you some of the results that we've gathered from them. The first one looks at the impact of citizenship. So we're gonna ask, does it actually make a difference if immigrants attain the citizenship of the host country? And we're gonna do that using a quasi-experimental study that we ran in Switzerland, and then an experiment, a randomized experiment that we just recently finished uh, in the United States. And then in the second part, I'm gonna focus on refugee resettlement, and I'm gonna talk about our efforts uh, to develop and deploy a human-centered artificial intelligence tool um, to help um, improve placement decisions uh, for refugees. So let's just jump right into the first stream. So obviously in many countries, there are heated debates about citizenship policy, right? Who should get access to citizenship? How long should that take? What should be the requirements? Um, but there's a pretty popular idea out there among many policymakers and researchers, which is that by basically making it easier for immigrants to attain host country citizenship, you can get a catalytic effect in terms of facilitating successful integration. And so the idea here is, is that by giving citizenship to immigrants, it would remove barriers to employment, it would reduce discrimination from natives by sending a signal, it might inspire immigrants to really invest in a future in the host country, it might invigorate their political participation. So you have this independent catalytic effect that comes from uh, being awarded citizenship of the host country. And there are significant policy efforts to try to give access to citizenship to immigrants, but the returns for these are uncertain, 
right? And if you think about this a little bit longer, you might think, well, you know, is it really the case that citizenship makes such a big difference, right? Often, in order to become a citizen, you have to be a permanent resident, and so you already might have quite a few rights uh, and obligations as a permanent resident, and so it's not clear necessarily that citizenship itself would make such a big uh, difference. If you look at the academic literature on this, there's a pretty strong conventional wisdom out there suggesting that citizenship does bring this catalytic effect for integration. There's this famous paper uh, by Bratzberg et al., which basically finds significant economic returns to citizenship in the United States. Um, and then there's a recent report by the National Academies of Sciences where they basically summarize this also, US citizenship improving employment outcomes, wages, uh, growth and access to better jobs. And in Europe as well, there's a recent review by the Institute for the Study of Labor where they synthesize the evidence also arguing that uh, liberalizing to access to citizenship could really uh, yield significant returns in terms of improving integration success. Now, a big problem when you look at a lot of the body of work that's out there is, is that it's almost exclusively observational, right? And we know that in observational studies, there's always the concern, right, that there might be unobserved confounding characteristics that lead to the results that we see. And so, if you think about it, if we want to identify the causal effect of citizenship, ideally we would randomly give citizenship to some immigrants and not others, right, such that they would be comparable in all other aspects but citizenship. But instead, right, how citizenship really works is there's this double selection process where typically a subset of immigrants applies for naturalization, and it's typically the ones that are more motivated, better educated, typically have more resources, are better informed. And then there's a second stage of the selection where government typically makes the decision about who, who among the applicants actually gets citizenship. And again, this decision is often based on unobservables as well. And so what you end up with, if you, in the literature, compare naturalized immigrants with non-naturalized immigrants, there are many differences other than citizenship between these two groups that might explain why you find better outcomes among the naturalized immigrants than among the non-naturalized immigrants, right? Is it citizenship or is it the differences in information level, resources, motivation that are driving these results? Often, we basically don't know. So what we basically try to do through multiple years of research is try to get around the selection bias, okay? Um, and we do this in two different ways. So in Switzerland, what we did is we focused on this particular process where some municipalities in Switzerland used so-called naturalization referendums to decide on citizenship applications. And so the way this worked is, is that if you're an immigrant, a permanent resident in Switzerland, and you wanted to become a Swiss citizen, what you had to do is you had to apply with the municipality in which you lived, they would check the eligibility of your application, and then ultimately what they would do is, is they would put your application to a popular vote, where they basically distribute leaflets to all citizens in the community, and you see some of these leaflets up here. They give you some basic information about the applicants, and then basically voters come to the polling place and they cast a secret ballot where they can either vote yes or no on your citizenship application, and only applicants that receive a majority of yes votes, more than 50%, those end up getting Swiss citizenship, okay? And so the advantage of that process from the research perspective is, is that what we can do is we can apply what's called a regression discontinuity design. That we're basically gonna focus now on only those who applied for citizenship, who faced these naturalization referendums. So we take the motivation out of the equation, right? And then more narrowly, we're gonna focus on those lucky applicants that basically just got barely enough votes to make it over the 50% mark, and we're gonna compare those to those unlucky applicants that just failed to receive 50% of yes votes, right? And so you basically have these applicants that are only a few votes apart, right? If you look at their background characteristics, they're essentially identical. There's this like sort of quasi-random assignment to citizenship that happens in these very, very closely decided naturalization referendums. And that's what we're gonna to use to isolate the effect of citizenship from these uh, selection into citizenship. All right, so this took multiple years. Um, it was a big data collection. We first basically surveyed all municipalities in Switzerland to figure out which, what, which are the ones that were using this ballot box process. Some municipalities have other mechanisms of deciding. Um, so we found the ballot box municipalities. We then went to their local archives. We extracted all of these leaflets and the voting results. And then we basically put them into a database. And then we were able to link this data with the tax records of these applicants, okay? And the important thing here is, is that these referendums ended in 2003. There was a court case which said you can no longer do this, but the tax records essentially track these applicants from like up to the current period. So we have about a 15 year follow up period which allows us to look at the long term effects of citizenship as well as the short term and the medium term effects um, to see whether these referendums that happened prior to 2003 actually make a tangible difference for their lives 
like uh, 10 or 15 years later. We also conducted a survey to measure their political integration and their social integration. And again, for most of these applicants, that survey took place about 15 years after the naturalization oh. referendum. So we're really getting at the long-term uh, effects here. All right, so what do we find? Well, quite strikingly, okay, what we find is, is that narrowly winning Swiss citizenship in this referendum by basically just getting barely over the 50% mark compared to those who are very, very close, get to like 49.9, what we see here is that there's a pretty dramatic difference in terms of the average annual earnings after the naturalization referendum. So this is the average annual earning post-referendum for those who barely make it uh, and those who barely don't make it. Here you can see the vote share. This is the 50% mark. And so you can see that even though back then these applicants are just separated by a few votes, right? 15, 10 years later, there's a pretty significant difference, okay? in their taxable income, in their earnings, okay? Suggesting that citizenship does seem to actually yield very significant returns um, for these immigrants in the sense of higher earnings. You can also see the results here in this difference and difference analysis where we differentiate these two groups, the ones that were narrowly accepted and narrowly rejected. And what you can see here is that for five years leading up to the referendum, they have essentially identical earnings trajectories. But then for the 15 years following the referendum, you see that there's this gap basically emerging where those that win Swiss citizenship end up with a higher earnings trajectory than those who are narrowly uh, rejected. Well, we do a lot of uh, robustness checks and what we find is, is that this effect, this positive effect of citizenship on earnings is actually concentrated among the more marginalized immigrants that are typically in the lower part of the earnings distribution or from origin countries that face a lot of discrimination. And what this suggests is, is that this effect of Swiss citizenship is mostly driven by a reduction in discrimination that we see from uh, employers rather than kind of a personal investment channel, uh, perhaps. Now, when we, find, when we look at political and social integration, we actually also find pretty sizable gains that come from citizenship. So what you can see here is, is these are the estimates for political integration. We ask them things like whether people vote, whether they have a high sense of efficacy, um, <clears throat> whether they have knowledge of Swiss politics. Um, and up here we look at social integration, so things like club membership and discrimination. And what we find is that for both of these, we actually get quite sizable um, impacts of citizenship improving political and social integration. And so uh, when you look at these scales that we built, it's about a one standard deviation unit increase, so quite substantial effect. In fact, if you compare 15 years later, those who barely won Swiss citizenship and you compare them to Swiss-born natives, their political integration, their political knowledge, their participation is essentially at the same level, while those who were barely rejected back then remain fairly marginalized from the political process. So what this suggests is that naturalization, at least in this context, really kind of helps to turn immigrants into these more Toquillian style citizens um, that we see here. And then we also find that these effects tend to be larger if this naturalization occurs earlier into the residency period. So even a few years earlier can make quite a difference. Okay, so this is Switzerland. Now I'm gonna shift gears and I'm gonna to move to the US, okay? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to replicate this analysis in the United States to see what like difference does US citizenship make? That's where a lot of this literature uh, kind of suggests high returns and started. And in the US, there are no naturalization referendums, okay? Instead, what we basically wanted to do is we wanted to run a true randomized experiment. And to the best of our knowledge, this is actually the first ever randomized experiment looking at the impact of uh, citizenship on downstream outcomes. So the way how we did this is, is we partnered with the Office of New Americans in the state of New York, and we co-designed this public-private partnership program, which was a program that was designed to help eligible low-income immigrants to apply for naturalization. And in particular, the margin that we wanted to tackle with this program was the cost barrier that low-income immigrants often face. So in the United States, in order to apply for naturalization, it's a $725 naturalization application fee at the time. And if you're living paycheck to paycheck, that's quite a barrier. And a lot of immigrants who might be motivated, who might want to become citizens, they simply basically can't afford to do it. So what the program did was that basically it advertised this opportunity where you could register for the chance to win a voucher that would pay your naturalization application fee so that you could naturalize for free, okay? And the eligibility criteria for this were that you had to be naturalization eligible, right? You had to be uh, residing in New York and you had to be low income, below 300% of the federal poverty level. Here you can see the former governor announcing this program and down there is the website where people could register for this program. So the way this worked was that there was an extensive outreach campaign and like you know, public television announcements, subway ads, things like this. 
The application window was open. Registrants could either register online, they could call into a hotline, they could go to an immigrant service provider in, in uh, New York and basically register in person. And then throughout that registration process, the eligibility for the program was screened. And if they were deemed eligible, they were basically entered into this lottery. The application window at some point closed. Then the lottery was won, a run. And then those who won in the lottery were basically given this voucher, which they could only use to file their naturalization application with uh, the United States Immigration and, uh, and Immigration Services. Uh, and those who basically didn't win in the lottery, they didn't get the voucher. They just got some basic information on how they can apply for uh, naturalization. And so what we did is, is we basically combined the data from this registration and the lottery and combined that with the credit records of people. And so we can basically track the economic outcomes over time. We can look at what happens to their income. We can look at what happens to their credit scores um, and things like this. And then we also run surveys where we basically measure these non-economic dimensions of integration. So political integration, social integration, psychological integration, again, similar to what we try to do uh, in Switzerland. The map here on the right is where you can see where most of these registrants, where the lottery is oversubscribed, happen to be in the five boroughs um, uh, in New York City. Okay, so what do we find? Well, the first thing that we find is, is that this removing this cost barrier actually makes a pretty dramatic difference to people's chances of becoming citizens. And so the, among the voucher winners, the naturalization application rates are about 36 percentage points higher than among those who didn't win in the lottery, suggesting that this cost barrier, which this voucher allows you to overcome now, is really a significant deterrent for a lot of motivated folks that want to become citizens but simply can't afford it. Now, the key question then is, is like, does this dramatic increase in the probability of getting citizenship actually then translate into tangible benefits right, that we would see in terms of economic, political, or social integration, like what we see in Switzerland? And the answer is that it absolutely does not. Okay? And so what you can see here are the four economic outcomes from the credit uh, files. We see log income up here, uh, the credit score up here. We can uh, have an index of financial distress and an index of access to credit, okay, to measure basically people's financial situation. And what you can see here is, is that for the two, the two years leading into the lottery, right, the trajectories of the winning of those who win the voucher and those who lose the voucher are essentially identical, right? That's exactly what we'd expect. This is a randomized experiment. Like this time we actually flip the coin. Um, but then what you see is, is that for up to five years following the lottery, despite the fact that this is much higher naturalization rate, we essentially see the same trajectories in terms of income, credit scores for the winners of the lottery and the losers in the lottery, indicating that citizenship um, uh, basically does not translate into tangible gains in terms of economic integration. In fact, when you do the formal estimates, these are pretty precisely estimated null effects. So it's not that the estimates are imprecise, it's really pretty precisely estimated null effects, like on the order of plus minus 1.5 percentage points or something. Um, and this holds over a five year follow up fear. We don't have 15 years of data here, right? But for the first five years, you see essentially nothing. Okay? Now, what about other non economic dimensions of integration? So, what we did is, is we used this, what's called this IPL 12 multi dimensional measure of integration, where we basically ask about political integration, economic integration, linguistic integration, navigational integration, psychological and social integration. And what you can see here is, is that basically for all of these different dimensions of integration, including the overall like index of holistic integration, we essentially get again these precisely estimated null effects, indicating that this basically did not make a tangible difference, not only in terms of economics, but also in terms of other dimensions of integration that we would care about. Um, and sadly, as a political scientist, you, know, you might look at the political integration and there's essentially absolutely nothing happening there, okay? Um, which is definitely surprising um, given what we've seen in, in, the, in the literature. Now, the one um, outcome where we do find a quite sizable effect is, is that citizenship did, in a lasting way, reduce people's fears of deportation, okay? And so we asked them how worried that they are that they might be deported, and what you can see here is that three years out, four years out, five years out, you basically get a significant reduction indicating that those who are able to get citizenship through this mechanism feel much more secure, and that is an important psychological benefit um, that they're getting uh, from this intervention. All right, now you might ask yourself, well, how do you rec reconcile these results, right, from this, from this randomized controlled trial with these famous studies by Bratzberg et al. and all this work showing that US citizenship has these positive economic returns. And so what we do is, in the experiment, is we can actually look to see what would be the results that we would get if we ignore 
the random variation in citizenship. And so what we do is we basically just look at the control group, okay, and then we run the typical kind of observational panel regression, okay, where we just use the natural variation and who selected into citizenship. And if you run that typical observational study regression, what you get is, is actually you almost exactly reproduce the gains in income that uh, Bratzberg et al. found in his, in his study. So if you run that panel regression, what you would like conclude is, is that citizenship actually increased earnings um, uh, income by about 7% uh, within four years, but it's basically entirely driven by the selection bias, okay? And so what this suggests is, is it's really bad news, I think, for the literature in the sense that, like, it suggests that these observational studies, right, even if you have panel data and even if you have only a sample of motivated people, right, these are motivated people who register for this program, right? so the motivation, which is a big confounder that we typically don't observe, it's already taken out of the equation, and still, even then, we basically get the selection bias, okay? All right, so what do we make of all of this? Well, clearly, you know, we don't want to close the book on citizenship, right, after these results. But um, what we have here is quite mixed findings, right? We see that in Switzerland, there does seem to be this, like, very considerable effect uh, in terms of citizenship facilitating economic and non-economic integration. But we find no discernible effect and strong evidence of selection bias um, in the New York experiment. And so these results for U.S. citizenship obviously don't imply that citizenship has no value for immigrants, right? It comes with like tangible legal benefits uh, that people value. But I think they do cast doubt on this conventional wisdom in the literature that citizenship can be this very effective policy lever to facilitate uh, the integration uh, of immigrants more broadly. And what the effect heterogeneity that we see from these studies, right, suggest this is that, that like we really got to look at these moderating factors that might explain why we see an effect in one context, but we don't see it in another context, right? And this could have to do with the intensity of labor market discrimination, for example, the strength of the signal of citizenship, right? Like in Switzerland, it tends to be more difficult to become a citizen, so maybe there's a stronger signal. Um, maybe there's also stronger discrimination by employers, something that we find um, in a follow-up study. Um, but in the U.S., we basically don't, don't see those results panning out in this, in this way. And so overall, I think more experimental work and quasi-experimental work is needed before we can close the book on this. Um, uh, but I think it's also important, um, especially in light of like, you know, the body of work that we already have, that we encourage more the publication of null results. Because I think another reason why we see this kind of pretty skewed picture in the literature is, is that because a lot of the null results that people might get are typically not making it out there into the published literature. And that can create quite a skew um, in what might be the accepted uh, wisdom that we have on the subject. All right, so now I'm gonna completely shift gear, okay, to a different immigrant group, um, <clears throat> and I'm gonna stay in the US for starters, but this, what I'm gonna talk about applies more broadly, and I'm gonna talk about placement policies for refugees, okay? And so the United States runs a refugee resettlement program where every year they're bringing in about 100,000 people, right, um, <clears throat> uh, that are sent to them by the UNHCR, and they resettle them somewhere in the United States. And the US, like many other countries, have a so-called placement policy process in order to determine where these refugees get placed within the host country, okay? The way this works in the United States is that there's nine resettlement agencies, and every week refugees are coming in, and there's essentially a caseworker, like a placement officer, that sits in front of an Excel sheet, and basically that placement officer makes a decision about where within the network of the resettlement agency they're gonna send this refugee that comes in at that particular point, right? And so depending on, you might come in on a, on a Wednesday, you might be sent to Dallas, uh, or you might be sent to a completely different city. And there's this kind of like this haphazard kind of process that determines um, these placements. And so what we did is we got these refugee resettlement agencies together in Washington, D.C., and we figured out like, you know, we talked to them about like, well, how do you do this placement, right? Like what factors do you take into account? What data do you have? What makes for successful placement? And is there maybe a way to optimize this placement using the data that we already have? And it turned out that there was very little consensus about what a good placement um, kind of is. Some people thought that more rural areas tend to work better. Others thought that more urban areas or mid-sized cities would work best. Um, and so we were able to get access to the data. And then using this data, we were able to study this placement process um, <clears throat> a bit more systematically. And so the first thing that we found by <clears throat> going through this data is, is that the place where refugees are settled has a pretty dramatic impact on their chances of economic success, okay? And so what you see here in this chart, this is real data. This is average 90-day employment, so 90 days after arrival for refugees that are resettled in the United States. The uh, locations here are anonymized. And so what you can see here is that for the locations at the top, locations one, two, three, four, five, say, the employment rates for refugees 90 days after arrival are essentially in the single digits, okay? 
So if you're placed there, you have a very low chance of finding work. But if you're placed in some of the locations towards the bottom of the slide here, right, locations 40 and plus, we can see that the employment rates are on the order of like 40%. Okay? And so this is very consistent with what the literature has found, which is that place is a really powerful driver of integration success. Okay? The location where you send can either be a, a stepping stone to successful integration, or it can really be a stumbling block. And we see these stark differences, right? similar types of people that are sent to these very different locations end up with very different success rates. So place matters. What we also find in this data is that the individual level characteristics matter quite a bit. Okay? And so here you see the relationship between these individual level predictors and the employment success. And what we see, for example, is that male refugees, those that enter at a younger age, those that have English abilities, and those that have higher levels of education, they tend to have higher employment probabilities. Okay? And so place matters, individual level characteristics matter. But what we were particularly interested in is to see in this data whether there are so-called synergies between places and people, meaning that we were curious to know like, you know, is it the case that particular types of refugees end up being a particularly good fit for certain types of locations, right? Where they might have a higher chance of finding work given their profile. And it turns out that this data actually reveals quite a bit of evidence for these synergies existing. And so here you can see a little example of this, where we have the effects of these individual level characteristics uh, in two locations, location 14 on the left and location uh, 31 on the right. And what you can see here, for example, that for refugees who speak English, there's a positive effect on the probability of employment, right? You get a premium for speaking English in location 14, but there's no such premium in location 31, okay? And then if you look, for example, at uh, refugees coming from Burma, you can see that they actually tend to have higher than average probability in location 14, but lower than average probability of employment in location 31, okay? And so now you put the pieces together and you think, well, if you're a placement officer, and you had access to this information, right, and you have a Burmese English-speaking family that you're about to assign, you might want to prioritize sending that family to location 14, where they're going to have a higher chance of having employment success, rather than location 31, where they're actually going to have a lower chance of employment success, okay? And so this is an example with just a few attributes and two locations. In general, right, how this really works in the policy process is, is that there's multiple attributes, there's many, many, many different locations, and there's thousands of refugees that are coming in. So trying to figure out these synergies when you don't even have access to your own data to like, get any feedback on how the placement you're doing and you're sitting in front of this Excel sheet is extremely difficult to do. Okay? But this is precisely um, maybe an area where like, modern data science can help and try to detect these synergies and make them accessible in the form of individualized recommendations to these placement officers. And so we embarked on this journey to develop this, what we call the GeoMatch uh, suit of algorithms, which essentially uh, works in the following way. We get this historical data, uh, where refugees were placed and whether they found work or some other integration metric that we want to optimize on. We then apply a bunch of machine learning methods to this historical data to learn these synergies between places and people over time. And then for newly arriving refugees, you can use these learned models to predict their expected employment success if sent to all of the different locations. And then based on these predicted probabilities, you can make basically optimal recommendations where you send people to the types of places where they have the highest chance of finding work, subject to all of the constraints that exist on the allocation, right? You can't just send everybody just to one location. Every location has a quota. Right? You can only send a certain number to every location, and then there might be individual level constraints where certain types of refugees need medical care or something, so they have to go to a big city, for example. Okay? And so by using this data to optimize the allocation, we would hope that not by doing anything different, just by basically using the data to make a more optimized allocation, we get improved um, outcomes. And so here you can see, a, just again, a toy example of how this works in practice. So let's say we have learned these uh, historical models, um, on the data, and then we have uh, five families, family A through E coming in here. Now, once we plug their features into the algorithm, we basically get the predicted probability. So we might find that for a family of the type of family A, we have a 20% chance of finding work in a place like Phoenix, but a 50% chance of finding work in a place like Atlanta. And then you have some X's here where some of the assignments are impossible because of these individual level constraints. Right? And then you can think about the task that the placement officer is tasked with, like you need to find the optimal allocation, right? but here you have like five, choose five, that's a ton of different ways of assigning these five refugees to the five locations. It's impossible essentially by trial and error to figure out the optimal allocation, 
uh, which would be to send family C to Phoenix, uh, family E to Atlanta, et cetera, et cetera, and you end up with a 44 expected employment rate rather than the most suboptimal sub allocation, which would end up with a 24% uh, percent employment rate. And so we can, again, like use these matching algorithms to basically help placement officers with this uh, uh, very complex uh, combinatorial optimization problem. All right, so does this actually work, okay? Um, well, one thing that we can do is, is we can run so-called back tests on the historical data. So the way this works is, is we take, let's say, a test cohort like of refugees who came in very recently. We observe their employment in the locations where they were actually sent, right? We set them aside. We train the algorithm on all of the historical data. We then feed in the data from this test cohort. We make a prediction. We basically go through the recommendations, and then we see, right, would they end up with higher employment had they been assigned with the recommendations from the algorithm rather than where they were actually sent uh, under the status quo allocation mechanism. And when you do this counterfactual exercise, what you find is, is that there seems to be actually quite some significant gains in the system, where under the algorithmically assisted allocation, you get about uh, a 48 percentage point uh, employment rate, a percent employment rate, while under the actual allocation, the same test cohort only had about a 32 uh, percent of finding work. So quite significant gains. You're not doing anything different here, right? You're sending the same number of refugees to the same number of places, okay? But you're doing basically better matching, okay? To basically identify and leverage these synergies. Now, is this fair? Okay, so one question you might ask, like you get these gains on average, but is it the fact that some right, refugees are benefiting much more at the expense of others, right? Whenever you're using something like this in the public domain, obviously that's a very important consideration. And so what we find in these back tests is, is that these gains from using these algorithmic recommendations are actually fairly widely distributed. So here you can see the gains broken down by the percentile of where people are in the employment distribution. So refugees towards the top here, they have a very high chance of finding work. Uh, and then refugees at the bottom, they tend to be disadvantaged in the labor market and have low probabilities of finding work. And what you can see here is that for every um, percentile rank, we basically get that the algorithmically assisted allocation ends up with a higher average employment rate than the actual allocation. And so what this suggests is, in, in technical terms, is that the algorithmic allocation actually sort of first order stochastically dominates the actual allocation, meaning that if you put yourself behind a wheel of ignorance, right, and you don't know whether you're going to end up in the top percentile or the bottom percentile, right, in principle, you should, like, prefer the algorithmic recommendations because, like, basically, regardless of where you end up in the distribution, on average, you're going to be better off in that particular uh, percentile. Now, we can also group these gain, the, look at these gains by subgroup, right? Uh, and so what we find here is fairly stable gains across age group uh, and gender, uh, English speaking yes or no, and also across um, education levels. If you're worried about that, you can also hard code that into the algorithm, right? If that's something that the policymakers um, want to uh, <coughs> uh, prioritize, for example. So these are back tests, right? And these are all good, and like that suggests that there might be some you know, slack in the system that we may, might be able to get some gains. But ultimately, right, um, in order to really see whether this works, we, we got to test it, right, right, through some sort of careful pilot uh, testing. And so since then, we've been talking to many uh, different governments who might be interested to actually implement this approach. And I think what people like about it in these governments is, is that this approach has a couple of advantages. One is, is that it's fairly flexible, okay, in the sense that you can adjust it to the specific network in the country, uh, adjust it to the specific types of data that you have available. You can pick any outcome metric of integration that you might want to uh, optimize on. It's pretty practical in the sense that you don't have to change anything else that you're doing about the process. You're doing an allocation anyway. You're just using the data to make more informed choices about the allocation that you're making. Um, and so it doesn't like force you to change the process. Um, and then it, it's also set up as a dynamic system where like as new refugees are being placed, their outcomes are being observed, we can basically feed that data back into the algorithm to basically learn how these synergies devolve or, or dissipate over time. So in, in, you know, in theory, on paper, like it's quite advantageous. Now, if you actually try to implement this, it turns out it's like really kind of hard to do, okay? And so it's much, much harder than running back tests on my computer. I can run back tests on my computer all day long, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but if you want to actually implement this in the real world, um, it's a multi-year process again. And so what we've embarked on a couple of years ago now is basically to work with various governments across the globe to actually try to implement this in practice, okay? And this is really like multi-year partnership work 
where we're sitting down with them, we're talking through like, you know, what exactly are the outcomes that you want to look at? What exactly is the data that you have available? We run careful back tests. We look, you know, the placement officers, like, what do you want this tool to do? Like, what, how, how does the allocation typically work? How can GeoMatch help with that? And then based on this partnership work, we put together a tool um, which now is actually being used both in the United States and uh, in Switzerland. So in Switzerland, it's being used to assign asylum seekers to different cantons. Um, and in the United States, we've now implemented it with one of the refugee resettlement agencies um, <clears throat> to use the allocation there. And then in other contexts, like the Netherlands or Canada, we are like in earlier stages, and there might even be a chance, uh, some interest to potentially do this um, in Mexico. So the way how it works in the United States, just to give this as a very quick case study, is essentially it's a human-centered uh, setup, okay? So the key is, is that the placement officer is the one who makes the final decision. But instead of sitting in front of these like multiple Excel sheets trying to like manually match refugees to the locations where there's capacity, it's all integrated into one interface as the placement officer is about to make a decision on the refugees that are coming in this week. You upload that into the system, the system then runs the algorithm and then basically spits out the recommendations and then the placement officer can either go with the recommendation or they can override the recommendation based on any additional information that they might have um, available. And so you can see here, this is the interface of what it looks like for one of these refugee resettlement agencies that is using this now. And so you can see these are the different refugees that are assigned in this week. Here are the recommendations, and then here are the constraints. And then you can hover over each of the um, locations and you get more information on like what particular types of constraints are being matched or, or not met for that particular refugee. And you can see, so like once you get into the nitty gritty detail of this, it actually like gets very, very complicated, okay? Uh -huh. And so this is what it looks like. Now, based on the anecdotal evidence, like they really like this tool because it makes their work a lot easier. They basically, for the first time, now have systematic data-driven feedback on like, you know, what the potential impact of their placements might be. Uh, and this is something that they're very grateful for. Um, the goal here is, is to run this in the context of an RCT, right, where like we would basically have uh, say half of the refugees being assigned with the help of these algorithmic recommendations versus like a quasi-random or random uh, recommendation uh, that models basically what happens under the current status quo. This is how the project is run in Switzerland, and in Switzerland it's running uh, with uh, a, a double-blind RCT right now. All right, so the conclusion here is, is that, again, we're like early stages with this. You know, it's all worked out on paper, and like, you know, we've written several uh, scientific papers with this, but the proof is really in the pudding, okay? And so running this in the real world with the implementation requires obviously very careful uh, testing and pilot testing, and there's still lots of open questions uh, that we're actively working on, both on the empirical side as well as on the science side. There's now a whole interdisciplinary team um, of folks from different disciplines at the Immigration Policy Lab that is working on all of these different questions. And that runs the whole gambit from doing qualitative research to incorporate like refugee voices into the process. So right now refugees have almost no agency in this process, okay? And so we're talking to them to see like, you know, what does a good placement look like for you actually, right? Do you understand why you're being placed in one place versus another, right? Like what makes a location a stumbling block or a stepping stone? Um, and then there's lots of thorny methodological issues, right? Like how do you deal with non-stationarity? What is the ideal outcome that you want to optimize on? Do you want to optimize on something short term or more on something long term, right? How do you incorporate fairness into this algorithm, right? Do you want to have fairness for the refugees? Do you want to have fairness for the locations that are receiving the refugees, right? And how do you build that into the algorithm and then how does that eat into the gains that you might be able to get, right? And so we have papers looking at that question. Um, and then there's obviously the, all these questions about how does the placement officer interact with the algorithm, right? How do you explain these recommendations so that people can actually make informed choices based on that? Um, and so it's a very active kind of research agenda. Now with that, um, I'm at the end and I very much look forward to your comments and feedback. I want to acknowledge the funders without whom this work would not be possible. And then also uh, all the different brilliant co-authors uh, that are helping in this effort to move this forward, right? It's really like a team, a team effort. And then I put some selected citations here that if you, you know, are interested in more of the nitty-gritty details of all of these studies and the algorithm and how exactly it works, you can look at this, uh, at these citations here to get, get, um, get some sense uh, for what that looks like. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>